is uh, I will introduce uh, Professor Zhang Xuan. Uh, Professor Zhang uh, have a talk about uh, 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 inherently chlorine resistant syncytium composed membrane for reverse osmosis. And uh, this comes from the Nanjing University of Science and Technology, China. Please welcome Professor Zhang's talk. Thank you, Professor Niu. And thank you for the audience. Thank you for the community who invited me to this talk. I'm really proud to be here and share my recent work, particularly on the thin film composite membrane for reverse osmosis. And also I would like to share how we have designed this project and uh, how we eventually uh, get, uh, got success in this project. So starting from the background, uh, according to a very recently announced new BBC News, uh, I just circled 11 cities, which is mostly running out of water in the next 10 years. So we find there are many capital cities on this map, including Beijing, Tokyo, London, etc. So the water supply city is mainly because of physical or the economic issues. In terms of China, we have only 7% of the water fresh water reserves, but we have huge populations which accounts as for the similar low level of the water per person per day for, for Chinese people. In addition to the water scarcity, the water pollution is another critical issue for, for, for China, which are calling the high-end water treatment technology. So we have to uh, do some water purification uh, process. So in terms of the water purification technology, the reverse osmosis membrane technology is uh, absolutely the domin dominating one across all industry. For example, compared with other thermal, uh, thermally based uh, processes, either uh, on the either for the distribution or the application volumes, according to some distinctive uh, statistics. So I'd like to give a brief introduction of how uh, our plant uh, work. So we we'll find the seawater coming from the very initial state. Uh, from here and uh, to encounter a serious pretreatment process uh, before the sea water coming to the, our unit. Usually we need the one pass, but sometimes we need the second pass to fully remove the borrowing in the sea water. So after the hour treatment, the fresh water can be stored or uh, uh, supplied to the custom end. Uh, specifically, if we see the flow diagram of the seawater treatment process, you will find two chemicals are critically needed in this process. So one is the sodium hypochlorite, which is usually added at the very initial state. We call this step the disinfection step, which is mainly uh, used to kill the bacteria in the seawater. So after that, we have to remove the active or the re residue chlor chlorine before the feed water come into the, our unit. So sometimes we add uh, the chemical like sodium bisphite or, or some other neutralization uh, chemicals. The, this is mainly because the, the residue uh, chlorine will have some uh, damage to the polyamide membranes. So, uh, so in this case, we have to do the uh, disinfection at the initial state, but we have to neutralize the residue chemicals. So in this case, uh, there won't be any chlorine in the, uh, from the, our unit. So the mm, membrane biofouling or the bacteria will regrow from this stage. So for the conventional process, we have to do the, do the chlorine disinfection, but to neutralize in the middle stage. So this will cause the membrane biofouling. According to some statistics, they account for nearly 7 billion US dollars for membrane uh, cleaning, flushing, or the model replacement uh, each year, each year, which is a huge number. So based on this background, we are thinking about whether there is a possibility to develop a membrane with chlorine resistant. So in this case, we, uh, we, we could not just simply, uh, we, we just simply let the chlorine solution into the membrane modules uh, so with the chlorine, there won't be any bacteria growth in the membrane module, which will keep our uh, long lifespan of our, our membrane modules. But everybody knows it's really hard. So why it's so hard? It, will, it should be back to the fabrication process of the membrane. So in terms of the fabrication process of the TFCL membrane, usually we uh, actually we are doing 
uh, we are using the two layers. One is called the substrate and the other is a barrier layer, which is a polyamide layer on top of the substrate. So for constructing the polyamide layer, usually for the industry, all the, acad all the academia uh, division, we are using the two monomer. The one is MPD, meta and diamine in the aqueous phase, while the other is trimethyl chloride, TMC, in the organic phase. So the two functional monomers will react quickly with each other at the interface of water and organic uh, solutions to generate the polyamide uh, polymetric polymer matrix. So here, I just give an example here. Once there is a polyamide linkage showing here, it is uh, unstable to the chlorine because there is active hydrogen here. So it will react with the chlorine to form the, to, to, with the n chlorination reaction followed with, for example, the alternate re re rearrangement, uh, the direct ring chlorination reaction and uh, finally, we will have the transitions or the loss of function uh, hydrogen bondings uh, among the polymer matrix. So against this background, we are thinking about designing new monomers to, to address this issue. Firstly, we think the secondary arming is better because there is um, an active hydrogen here. So we are thinking about using a secondary arming instead of the MPD, which is a typical primary amine. So if we are using the secondary amine, there won't be a, a active hydrogen here. So there won't be a, a chlorination reaction occur. Secondly, because the chlorine substitution on the bandane ring is an electrophilic substitution. So we need to add some electron withdrawing group. We call the EWG group on the bandane ring, which is used to further lower down the electron density on the bandane ring. So in this case, the chlorine substitution will be much hindered. So based on, the, this, based on this background, we are designing the new series of monomer. You will find the sulfonic acid group attaching here is used as the EWG group, while the amino group here, we are using the secondary amine. So initially we have designed the new monomer, which we call the EDBSA. We also compare the physical properties of our new monomer with MPD. We find there are many advances of our new monomer. Furthermore, we also do some molecular optimization. For example, in order to, to achieve the high water permeability, we, we just replace the flexible uh, ethylene moieties with the rigid benzylic moieties. And also, we could also manually add some sterile hindrance into the monomer structure to enforce the chain rotation during the polymerization process. Also, the aim is to create more free volumes inside the polymer matrix. We have also done the molecular dynamics to prove our findings. But the result is showing that uh, under this uh, monomeric uh, designing, we, we could achieve the higher water permeability while maintain the acceptable uh, membrane selectivity. So, come to this slide. We 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 are know that we know that we have successfully developed the three new monomer, which is suitable for fabricating the new owl membrane. But this is not our end. We are we were aiming to to develop new membrane with chlorine resistance. So next step, we are checking. We were checking the chemical stability of the newly designed our membrane. But unfortunately, all these three membranes showed very poor stability towards the chlorine. For example, if uh, you can see the pictures of the polymer, the colors of the polymer change to yellow, uh, indicating the degradation or the uh, deformation of the polymer chains. So why this phenomenon occurred? So we just stopped and rethinking about the reactivity of the polymerization. For instance, we thought that the sulfonic group will further de de decrease the nucleophilicity of the amino group, which uh, kind of deserved, uh, disturbed the reactivity of the new monomers. Also, this disturbance will, will uh, affect the cross-linking density of the top layers. And also there might be some new reaction pathways between the positively charged chlor chlor chloride with the negative charged nitrogen group here, moieties here, which is uh, some, some different to our previous considerations. So eventually we came to this conclusion that the sulfonic group will promote the hydrolysis of the amide group. So in fact, 
we we are trying to use a secondary amine to to inhibit the N chlorination, and also we use the EWG group to to lower to uh, to lower the electron density of the benzene ring, but unfortunately they are they are generates the third degradation pathway, which is the direct hydrolysis of the amide group. So after five to uh, six years efforts, we eventually reached to this conclusion that for conventional MPD series, which we all know for decades, uh, their chlorine resistance at high pH condition is relatively good, although the polymer did degrade it to, to, to some extent, but with lowering down the pH condition, the degradation become very fast. For our sulfonated polyamide series, the chlorine, re chlorine stability at the uh, Acidic condition is relatively good, although it's not good enough. But with increasing the pH to alkaline condition, the polymer or the membrane degrade very fast. However, if we if we see the antibacterial properties abilities of the two species, one is the acid form and the other is the ionic form, you will find the antibacterial properties ability of the acid form is nearly one hundred times higher than the ionic form which I would not uh, explain too much detailed. So we are expecting that the disinfection step or the membrane filtration step will occur. We will start at this range, for example, the pH 4 to pH 7, at a little bit acidic condition in order to increase the disinfection ability effect. However, if we see the range from our membrane or the MPT series, now, uh, neither of the two types of membrane can work well. Uh, within this range. So come to this step, we, we found that things almost come to the end and we, and we nearly have no choice to go. So actually this is a very tricky thing that we, we are using polyamide for decades, for example, uh, for nearly half a century since its invention. But now we are told that the polyamide membrane is not good enough. So next, so the strategy is to, to use the chemistry, which I usually say chem is try. So previously our designing concept is, is to find new materials that is up to the our standard, then check the chlorine stability. So in the next step, we are trying to find some new material that is inherently chlorine resistant. Then we <clears throat> finally, then we start to optimize the properties of desalination properties of this new material to the our standard. So this is a, a kind of different pathways, designing strategies. So fortunately, we, uh, we were inspired from the swimwear, which is typically a material com, uh, com, consisted from um, polyester, uh, polyester poly, polymers. So we are using, we, we just do some modifications. We are using the DHBA, a unimonomer, which you, I, I showed here, the phenonic hydroxy group here is used to react with TMC, while the carboxy acid group here is the EWG group here, while it can also react with the hydroxy group to form the self-crosslinked hyperquenched polyester polymer matrix. So based on the two layer, the interfacial polymerization, we was aim, we were able to uh, fabricate the new polyester our membrane, which is up to the our standard. You will find the A values and the rejection to sodium chloride relatively inferior to that of SW30, but still good enough in terms of the new polymer type. And this is the most important figures, which I would like to showing to you that, uh, for example, this is pH 4, pH 7, and pH 8, you will find at a relatively wide pH range, our membrane showed no degradation towards the high total chlorine exposure amount. While for the <coughs> commercial membrane, stop the 30, the degradation started from the very initial state. And also we have checked the regeneration performance of our uh, membranes. You, uh, for example, we pre-filed our membrane with two typical uh, bacteria, but just simply use the chlorine uh, for flushing for a few minutes. The performance will gener could be generated nearly 100%. 
actually it's a very amazing result so based on these findings we were fortunately uh, published our this work on nature sustainability and quickly got very positive response from the worldwide press or medias for example the yale today the p the physics organization and also the press from china <coughs> <coughs> sorry for that and now we can slightly scale up our membrane uh, fabrication membrane sheet uh, to uh, A4 size, and you will see the membrane performance, the stability uh, towards the ox oxidative test. It's very stable for our membrane. So based on these findings, we are reconsideration. We are reconsider that whether there is a need to to have some change in the sea, the desalination plant. For uh, taking the seawater desalination plant as an example, conventional process need to add the chlorine at the very initial state while to remove the chlorine at the middle. So in this case, the membrane biofouling would be a critical issue for the our membranes. But while uh, as there is a um, new our membrane with chlorine resistant, so we don't need to neutralize the active chlorine in the middle state. We just to do the desalination with chlorine. So there won't be, theoretically, won't be any bacteria growth in the, our membranes. And also another benefit, another merit is actually there are many, there would be some neutral uh, chlorine, for example, the hypochloric acid will penetrate into the permeate of the our pass. So in this case, we also won't uh, need to add more chemicals to the, uh, to the permeate and to, to the custom end. So I believe this would be another a merit for the new membranes. So come to the conclusion that uh, polyamide membrane is still good. We have to understand that polyamide membrane is still good for the by means of desalination, but in any type they are vulnerable to chlorine. For our polyester membrane is inherent chlorine resistant, but he but its drawback is it's relatively sensitive to high pH continue, especially at very high. Uh, at the alkaline condition at a high pH, for example, pH 9, pH 8, up uh, pH 10, or even higher, the polyester will degrade in any case. And third, because we have the uh, chlorine resistant our membrane, so I believe it's time to reconsider the desalinating plant, the construction, or the uh, reformation. So finally, I would like to thank my collaborator. Uh, Professor Eli Malik at Yale University and other collaborators, and also thank the funding support. And thank you very much for the attention from our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. John. Uh, I think it's time for the Q&A session. Any question from the audience? Okay, I think uh, we have one question from the audience. Uh, is asked that Prof. John, thanks for your inspiring talk. How about the reactivity of the new monomer you used for polyester type of our membrane? Good question. Reactivity. Actually, the reactivity of the phenolic monomer is much lower than, than the metaphenylene diamine. So we have to use some unique techniques to increase the reactivity. For example, we adjust pH or add some additives. Anyway, we have to in increase the reactivity. Otherwise, it won't form a defect-free thin film on top of, of the substrate. Okay. Mm. Uh, another question? Okay. If there's no uh, question, we can move on to the next presenter. I think... Okay, thank you. Thank John, to host the, the session. Okay, thank you, Professor Lee. So I will host this section again. So our third presenter is Professor Yun Chu Wu from University of Science and Technology, Republic of Korea. But uh, note that this is a pre-recording uh, presentation, so probably we have uh, the presenter is not available for Q and A. Uh, anyway, let's start this. Yeah, Aaron, thank you. Yeah, Aaron, please present it. This is yeah, thank you. Uh, 
I'm working at the Korean Institute of Civil Engineering and Building Technology, as well as the University of Science and Technology as an assistant professor. Today, I'd like to talk about enhancing the performance of reverse osmosis membrane by interfacial polymerization in isophagy with the addition of conservant. Contents are as follows. First, introduction. The membrane technologies have attracted attention and have become one of the most popular technologies for a wide range of separation applications. Among pressure-driven membrane processes, polyamide reverse osmosis and nanofiltration membranes are widely used because of their separation efficiency. Polyamide synfilin comfort membranes are commonly used in the membrane fabrication industries owing to their excellent salt, rejection, and high permeability. PATFC membranes have three different layers that can be easily controlled during fabrication to achieve desirable permeability and rejection. Among the different RO membrane fabrication methods, interfacial polymerization IP has received worldwide attention. Typical PATFC membranes are composed of three layers. First layer is a non oven polyester fabric base. Second layer is a porous middle support polysulfur layer. And an ultra thin polyamide active layer. This slide shows the advantages and disadvantages. Advantages of PATFC membranes. Um, we withstand high temperature and operate under a larger pH variations and more stable to biological attack and high pressure compaction. Uh, in terms of the drawbacks, primary drawbacks of the PATF membranes are as follows. The most important uh, drawback is trade off between the permeation and salt rejections. Uh, I will talk about objectives of this study. First one is improving miscibility between the aqueous and organic solution at the time of the IP process has been effective in enhancing the membrane surface hydrophilicity. Addition of coserband in organic hexane pages from a narrow miscible zone between the water and organic pages by reducing the solubility difference and interfacial tension. Third one is that developing a loose PATFC membrane has become a solution for the preparation of an RO membrane with high permeability without affecting salt rejection. Then, how can we fabricate coarser band assisted interfacial polymerization RO membrane? Firstly, we prepare a polysulfone sulfur. Second, MPD mixed with Tevola or DI and poured on the polysulfone sulfur. After that, TMs mixed with sorbents and with acetone and poured on the MPD reacted polysulfon sulfur. Then we can uh, gain the coserband assisted interfacial polymerization RO membrane. The second section is the material cell method. The chemical composition of solution uh, is followed to tables. The performance tests are as follows as well. Then, you, as you can see, this schematic diagram of laboratory scale RO testing cell membrane separation system. The experimental condition of this RO is uh, as follows the membrane area of the 19.625 square centimeter, temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, feet. Uh, solution is 2000 ppm of NaCl or MgCl2. Leisure trend discussion. 
The CEM and EDX analysis of this self-fabricated UF membrane are shown in A and B. Carbon, oxygen, and sulfur peak are generally available in the composition of sulfur UF membranes. The surface of the sulfur layer is smooth and homogeneous before the formation of the polyamide layer. As you can see, in the SEM image in A and B and C, the rock surface morphology characteristic is evident for the formation of the polyamide layer by an interfacial polymerization of MPD-TMC reactions. The membranes with hexane, heptane, and isofar-G-based membranes were closely related. Compared with the supporting layer, the polyamide layer structure increased the surface roughness and also directly increased the surface area, which is an effective way of increasing the permeability of the membrane. In this study, we employed three different the organic solvents, which is the hexane, heptane, and isopazine. The morphology of the membrane prepared without the coastal band showed a typical rich and valley structure similar to that of the commercial membrane. Furthermore, the pore size of the formed membranes increased. Compared with the uh, interfacial polymerization membranes, the acetone audit membrane structure increased with an increase in acetone concentration, confirming that a multi layered polyamide layer with a high acetone concentration was formed in an organic sorbet. As you can see in an atomic force microscopy, the CAIP membrane shows a flatter surface compared to the IP membrane because of the large rich and belly structure which is consistent with the SCA image of the membrane surface. In contact angle, for a prepared membrane, the contact angle measurement was below 19 degrees, which is an indication that our membranes have hydrophilic properties. The membranes prepared through the addition of coastal bands show the higher contact angle compared to membranes prepared using conventional IP processes. Related to zeta potential, all IP and CAIP membranes show the similar negative zeta potentials as shown in A. The zeta potential of all the membranes decreases with an increase in pH. At low pH value, the protonation of the amine group. At a higher pH, the deprotonation of carboxy groups. The membranes display a high negative charge in the following order: isophagy, hexane and heptane. The addition of acetone results in a pure polyamide layer with a high negative charge and its negative charge gradually increased with the concentration of acetone. In FTIR, a strong band was present as follows. 1660 is CO stretching and 1547 amide 2 was owing to C and stretch. A band of approximately 1610 PA aromatic ring and H. As you can see, the figure A, B, and C, this showed that with an increasing coastal bed concentration, the typical polyamide band intensity increased for hexane, heptane, and isopergy based membranes. Thus, the amount of polyamide was increased by the addition of acetone as a coastal band. Larger amount of polyamide appears to win, widen the explanation and thicken the pH skin layer. We analyzed mechanical property because the RO applied very high pressures. Our membranes registered a higher tensile strength and qualified for the high pressure membrane process. The IP membranes have almost similar tensile strength values in degrees of order as follows. With the addition of acetone, the mechanical 
properties of the membrane will hexane and heptane slightly decreased. And the strain breaking point increased compared to that of the IP membranes. In general, the tensile strength and Young's modulus results confirmed that both IP and CAIP membranes showed high mechanical strengths which indicate durability during long-term operation. Here is the performance test in RO. As you can see the figure A2 and B2, water flux of the higher for hexane, heptane, isopathy order. In terms of salt reaction, heptane, hexane, isopathy. Uh, between the salt rejection and water flux, the he hexane with 0.5 wave percent acetone membrane showed a higher flux and a high salt rejection performance. So we decide the membrane for long term operation. As you can see here, the long-term operation flux performance of the hexane with 0.5 wave percent acetone CAIP membrane. The durability and stability of RO compass membranes are major factors in desalination application. The CAIP membranes exhibit good, du good durability with water flux and rejection properties remaining constant during the entire testing period, even more than five days. The water flux of the CAP membrane slightly declines from 55 to 50 LMH per bar in the first 20 hours and remain the same during the long-term study. The salt rejection is 96%, which means it has this stability. The last section is the concluding remark. The summary. The CAIP process loses and multi-layer membrane structure with increased pore size form. The membrane formed with hexane organic solvent showed the highest flux. The Cosorbent Assist Interfacial Polymerization approach provides a new level of freedom for the synthesis of NF or ROPA membranes with excellent performance without any further post-treatment. Additionally, tensile strength and long-term tests show that CAIP membranes are durable under high operating pressure. With CAIP, the membrane performance can be increased without compromising rejection and membrane strength, which is successfully qualified as promising candidates for RO and F membrane fabrication for desalination and water treatment. This work was supported by Korea Environmental Industry and Technology Institute as High Purity Industrial Water Production Process Localization Development Program from Korea Ministry of the Environment. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, the presenter is not available for question A. So, so next we are our last speaker, Professor Xue Song Li from Tongji University, China. Let's welcome him, Professor Li. Uh, thank you, Prof. Zhang. I, I need to share my... Yes, please share your screen. Mm. Okay, found it. Uh, can you see my? Yes. 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 Great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Prof. Zhang. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Xiu Song from Tongji University. Um, my presentation topic is the role of ion dehydration in the separation of uh, quaternary ammonia cation ion and uh, inorganic cation ions by nanofiltration membrane. 
Uh, actually, it's the part of work that I'm still working on. So all the data in this partition is unpublished. Uh, so any critical comment for, for on this um, part work uh, is welcome. Uh, first, I want to introduce a uh, part of, uh, sorry, the quaternary ammonia cations, compounds, uh, QEC. Uh, I think most of you guys have probably have already heard about this uh, chemical. Actually, it's, uh, this is the uh, uh, structure of uh, QEC. Uh, basically, it has one uh, nitrogen atom connected with four function groups. The actual uh, QEC has been widely used for disinfectants, substance, substance catalysts. Uh, it's very commonly used uh, uh, compounds, um, particularly in this uh, pandemic pandemic period. Uh, in our hand uh, washing gel, uh, most of hand washing gel contains the QEC. Uh, today, I want to talk about this uh, particular chemical. It's called tetramethyl ammonia hydroxide. It's also one form, uh, one type of QEC. Uh, it's the most. Uh, this is the simplest uh, QEC compound. Uh, the nitrogen atom is connected to four methyl group. Uh, it's widely used uh, in uh, for the action of a silicon developer of FCD industrial catalyst and pharma intermediates. Uh, especially in semiconductor industry, it's very extensively used. Mm. But it's also very toxic. Uh, it can cause the acute toxic toxicity to a human body and aquatic organisms. Uh, in Europe Union, the discharge limit is uh, around seven milligram per liter. Uh, in industry, we they always use the biological process to treat this kind of a chemical, uh, this is uh, the, the, this type of uh, uh, contaminants. Uh, basically the TM, uh, the TM, uh, this uh, uh, chemical will go to the UASB is a uh, type of uh, anaerobic bioreactor. After that, it goes to the aerobic tank. And after the secondary clarifier, uh, the effluent just be discharged. But, the, um, but we found that uh, the concentration of the TMA in this effluent is uh, about always above 50 milligram per liter. So it's uh, according to the regulation standard, it's not allowed to be dis discharged directly. So uh, in industry, sometimes it just uh, diluted with other wastewater and then discharged. But it's not, uh, I think with increasing the, uh, with the increasing standard, uh, this uh, this kind of mode is not allowed in the future. So they want to uh, find a more effective measure to control this concentration of uh, uh, TMA in the effluent. Uh, of course, this secondary effluent not only contains TMA, it also contains other inorganic ions like, such as uh, sodium, potassium, ammonium, and of course, uh, some uh, ions like chloride. Um, so when I think about that, maybe after this uh, effluent, we can add a sec uh, the post-treatment process, uh, like an NF membrane process, to separate this TMA and uh, other inor inorganic ions. And this TMA can be recycled back to the biological process. And this inorganic uh, ions, uh, we hope that they can permeate through this NF membrane and then discharge di directly. Of course, we need to find a suitable uh, NF membrane to separate them out. Uh, before we do that, we need to know the orange of the NF selectivity. Um, we probably, every people have already know that for uh, in the in traditional model for nanofiltration, the main mechanism for selectivity is steric exclusion, donor exclusion, and dial electric exclusion. Uh, of course, some, uh, some study, uh, recent study already sh uh, also show that ion dehydration also one uh, dominant mechanisms for the ion selectivity. So we compare this um, TMA with other inorganic uh, ions. Uh, in this uh, program, you, you can see that uh, the TMA, the hydrated diameter is around 7.34 angstrom. Uh, it's a little bit higher than the sodium ion and the potassium ion, but they are very similar. So I, 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 we don't know whether the NF membrane can separate, can separate them efficiently. Uh, but 
but we need to try. So very simple, we just use a commercial membrane NF270 to do the test. We choose this uh, uh, source to do the test. Uh, the, the, the blue bar represents the rejection and the red bar is the water permeability. We can see that the water permeability for all source, uh, when we test the all source, the full source, the water permeability is very similar, but the rejection uh, is quite different. For this three, uh, the left three source, the rejection is almost same, but for TMA chloride, this rejection is much higher than these others. Uh, so if we see the, we, if we look at the hydrate di diameter of these ions, it's quite a, it's a little bit surprising because TMA is not the largest ions. It's uh, smaller than the lithium chloride, lithium ion. If we look at the hydration energy, because the hydration energy is strongly correlated to the ion dehydration mechanism. Uh, if, uh, in, according to the st other study, if the ion has a higher hydration energy, it means that it takes a long, a high, uh, we need a uh, higher energy input to get rid of the hydration shell. Uh, but we can see that the TME has the smallest hydration energy. So from this uh, result, um, we are little, we were a little bit puzzled because the uh, the traditional uh, model cannot explain our uh, phenomena. So we want to, based on this uh, uh, this study, we can we reached uh, uh, the first uh, hypothesis. I think maybe the energy barrier. Um, might dominate in this uh, transport phenomena. We uh, we all know that uh, this is the graph graph to show this uh, principle. Uh, the ion will transport the feed to permeate through the membrane. So uh, basically, the, uh, every every ion need to overcome an energy energy barrier. So the if the the ion encountered a higher energy barrier, definitely it will have a higher rejection. Um, so based on our results, the TMA has a higher rejection than other inorganic ions. So we can uh, speculate that the TMA also has the highest energy barrier than the others. So let's uh, we, we then we follow following this hypothesis. We did some experiments. Uh, the principle is uh, simple. It's basically a one form of the Arrhenius equation. So if we know the uh, we even know the salt flux. And uh, we, uh, if we know the salt, we, we need to measure the salt flux uh, under different temperature, and then we plot it. We can get a linear plot, a uh, fitting. And then according to the, the slope, we can get the E value. And this is the, the left uh, bottom corner it shows the experimental setup. Uh, the setup is very uh, simple. Uh, the, salt, the left chamber is the salt solution. The right chamber is, contains dear water. Then salt we are transported from left to the right. And then we just need to measure the conductivity in the left, right chamber. Then we can get, calculate the, the salt flux. And then we just need to do uh, uh, to test the salt flux under different temperature. We can get the result on the right. Uh, as you, can, you guys can, can see, uh, we can get the perfect uh, the linear fitting for all salts. Uh, we can also ca ca can see that the, um, the TMA chloride has the higher energy barrier than the other source. Uh, but this result can only show the, we all know that uh, when we measure this energy barrier, it, it actually is the energy barrier of the source, not the ions, because the cation and the ions transport simultaneously. They need to maintain the uh, electron neutrality of the solution. So we are wondering whether we can measure these uh, ions uh, independently, because we, uh, we want to know how much energy barrier for one ion. And then we go, go to the next uh, step. Uh, this is the working principle to measure the, in the individual ions. Uh, the first, uh, this uh, part of work has to, be, uh, has to be separated two steps. The first step that is that we need to first measure the membrane potential uh, uh, on, the, on the left using the current voltage measurement setup. And after we get the membrane potential, we can get the transport number for the cation ions. After we get the transport number, 
uh, we move to the second step on the right. Uh, we need to measure the membrane conductor used to the electrochemical impedance spectra, spectral scope. Uh, we need to measure the membrane conductance and the transport number and the different temperature and then uh, uh, using the Arrhenius equation to get the fitting and then we can get the E value. That's the how we get the uh, energy barrier for the individual ions. Okay, let's see the results we have already got. Uh, for one sort, of course, we get two uh, linear, linear fitting. One is for the chloride, another one for the uh, cations. Uh, from the four results, you can see that uh, the chloride has a very similar result. That means that the chloride transports through the membrane. The transport of uh, chloride through the membrane is uh, independent of this cation transport. Uh, but the cations have different uh, values. Uh, and you can see that the order of the energy barrier is that the TMA still has the highest energy barrier than the other inorganic cations. So this uh, result is also within our expectation. Uh, it means that the TMA indeed has a higher uh, energy barrier when it transports through the NF270. Uh, then the question is that why TMA has the highest energy barrier than others? Uh, we go a little, little, little bit deeper into the structure of these ions. We can see that although the lithium ion has higher hydrogen diameter than TMA, but it, I use the, the, the shallow blue to represent the hydrogen shell, but I use the deep, very dark blue to represent the core of this ion. So we can see that TMA has a very large ionic diameter than the other uh, inorganic ions. That means it's, so although it has, very, uh, the, it has a similar hydrogen uh, uh, diameter uh, uh, in compar uh, compared to the other ions, but its uh, ionic diameter is sig significantly larger. So I think uh, probably this is explains the uh, the phenomena cannot be ex uh, explained by the traditional model. So we propose the second hypothesis is that uh, when, the T we, when the TMA transports through the F NF membrane, because the NF270, the pore size is very similar to the hydration, uh, hydrated diameter of the TMA. So when it goes through the pores, some part, the hydration shell will be partially shielded. But the, because it has higher uh, ionic diameter, so the steric hindrance is still very significant. So it's still the transport of TMA still experiencing a very high energy barrier. But for the inorganic cations, such as uh, sodium ion, it has a very large uh, hydrated ion <coughs> diameter. The hydration shell is much larger than the TMA. So when it goes through the monopause, the the water the shell the shell the hydration shell can be easily compressed or partially dehydrated. Uh, so the steric hindrance uh, from this uh, for this uh, sodium chloride uh, sodium ion is much less than the TMA. So uh, from this hypothesis, I can uh, conclude that uh, the steric hindrance of partially dehydrated ion. A dominance in the TMA transport. Uh, of course, we want to validate our hypothesis. So we move on to the molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, but it's a little bit tricky to do the simulation because, uh, uh, you know, the polyamide membrane is, uh, if you want to precisely simulate the polyamide uh, structure, uh, it is very time consuming. Uh, so we have uh, simplified this uh, structure. Uh, for example, we, for, we use, just use the polyamide to represent the NF270, and then we'll create the water and polyamide and water interface. And then we, the basic idea is, is that we just want to explore that whether uh, the, when the ion transport through the polyamide, whether the steric hindrance will dominate during this, uh, 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 during this transport. Of course, uh, the, we also need to include the ion dehydration and the, uh, ion, the electro repulsion into consideration. 
but uh, this part of work is still ongoing. So I um, apologize that I cannot release much more information here. I hope I can give you guys uh, more information in near future. Uh, last but not least, I want to uh, get, get some uh, conclusion based on my work is that uh, obviously the energy barrier of ion through the nano pulse uh, determines the ion rejection. We can clearly see our result from our results. The second one is that the TMA ion uh, has a higher energy barrier than the inorganic ion through NF270. That's why it has a higher rejection than the others. The, set, the third one is that uh, we found that the energy barrier of TMA is mainly contributed by the size exclusion of the nanopores to the partially dehydrated TMA uh, ion. Uh, of course, this part of work has still to be validated by my our uh, molecular dynamic simulation. I think uh, that will be done in near future. Uh, okay, last, uh, thank you very much. Uh, th your any critical comment is welcome. Thank you, Professor Lee. So we have one question from our audience. Uh, thank Professor Lee, nice work. Since what happens during the transport is partially dehydration, does it still make sense to use the total hydration energy as the indicator? Uh, that's a right. question, yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, when we do this uh, simulation, uh, when we do the calculation, uh, Oh, I think this part, right? Yeah. Actually, when you, uh, the guys, uh, the hydrogen energy is always used to the to represent the, uh, the energy barrier uh, caused by the dehydration. Uh, but for this, uh, but it, it's very difficult to precisely evaluate the dehydration energy. So. That's why the reason why we want to use the molecular dynam dynamic simulation to get the precise evaluation. I, I don't know whether I explained it this well. Um, if we cannot, uh, because I read a lot of papers, they also use this uh, energy to, or to say, okay, uh, the lithium has the hydrogen energy. So it, the, 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 the hydrogen energy is also higher, but how they uh, to quantify the precise the hydrogen energy, but uh, they didn't give uh, any much uh, details or uh, uh, correct uh, quantification method. So that's why we need to employ the, uh, I think uh, maybe the molecular dynamic simulation to get a precise value. That's what uh, we, we, are, we need to do and what, they are, uh, what we are currently working on. Okay, thank you, Professor Li. So, thank you, Professor. Thank you. So time for end our session. So thank you very much for all the audience. Thank you, Professor Shum. Thank you all. So let's stop our recording and thanks again.